Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 19, titled Red Tape. It has to be one of my more favorite names of an episode in Season 3. Straightforward. No little puns into the name like last week or anything like that. It's about a dirty cop because that's what Miami Vice does well. When you hear Red Tape, you know it's something internal. You know IA is getting involved. <laughs> Everybody's dirty there. <laughs> it originally premiered on March 13th, 1987. It is written by Dennis Koopa. Koopa. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Cooper. He's directed a bunch of episodes. Made for each other, Sons and Lovers, The Good Caller, Streetwise. He's also the third season co-producer. So this fits with what happens in season three where the producers basically write every episode. It is directed by Gabrielle Beaumont, who has one more episode coming called Heroes of the Revolution. Revolution, which is the last episode of season three, which, believe it or not, is only in five weeks. I know. I can't believe that. We're going to be done with season three. That's incredible. And I cannot wait. To let the hype begin for season four. I cannot wait for season four because it's Miami Vice, the Dallas season. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. You, you thought it was like a soap opera before? <laughs> I can't wait for UFOs and devil possessions. <laughs> I was going to say, someone might be possessed. I don't know. Someone might get amnesia. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. Someone does get amnesia. Oh. <laughs> Before we get started, the chicken and see what's going on in each other's lives, guys, I got another one this week. You know me. I'm the adventurous type. I go out and go do all these crazy events, go by myself. We got a young child, so it's hard as a couple to go out with a baby and go do uh, adult things. <laughs> I go to movies, say, or something like that. And I'm, we're not that those kind of people who take like their one year old to go see Thor. No, don't <laughs> be those people. <laughs> so I bought a so ticket. Got a little nudity. They won't remember. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so I got a ticket to see my favorite movie of all time, starring Tommy Wiseau in the room. They were doing a live, not a live, but like a, um, a theater screening at our local Alamo Draft House for one of the lucky areas to have an Alamo Draft House. So I got a chance to see it on the theater, did the theater experience. People are throwing spoons at the screen, singing along to the sexy music. It was fantastic. <laughs> but I may have made a mistake, pals, because I didn't find out until I got there that at the same time as I was seeing the room, Tymok, the star of the 1985 karate classic in The Last Dragon, was there for a screening of the movie and signing autographs and taking selfies with people in person in the theater. Show sure enough, you missed Money. out. <laughs> I feel I felt deflated when I got there <laughs> and I saw that the one of my favorite action movies from the 80s star was there. I even <laughs> saw him like as I walked in, but alas, I didn't get a chance to talk to Timok. If you're out there, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I have a sneaking suspicion for enough money, you could have bought his time for a few hours. <laughs> I didn't know what to do because I got there and I had the ticket already for the room. And I really wanted to see because it's like a Rocky Horror Picture Show kind of performance when you see it in the theater where there's if you don't know anything about the movie. First stop and go watch it and then go see it live because it's a great movie to see in the theater. But more importantly, if you've never seen The Last Dragon, go see that. And Bruce Leroy and Show Nuff and Glowing Karate, stop mm -hmm. right now. Pause this podcast. And Vanity. And Vanity, go watch that movie. Then come back to this podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> come back, though. Just make sure you come back. Don't and, leave, In a weird combination, Vanity will be on our episode next week. Yes, she will. She's the main so. character in it. Wow, weird. <laughs> I look forward to talking about her. <laughs> well, this episode is full of guest stars as well. This was, and I know I'm not speaking for the group here, but I love this episode. This is a fantastic episode, and I am so excited that the Tubbs, the no nonsense Tubbs, <laughs> is back. He's back with a vengeance. Take no prisoners, okay? <laughs> I don't got time for oh, you. Yeah, I definitely like this Tubbs. <laughs> you guys are fools. Let's go talk about this episode. So we open up and we're on the bad side of town in Miami 
And you can tell us the bad side. That's where you run down. There's gr- gr- graffiti cars. And comes pulling up is Crockett in his $250,000 Ferrari, complaining <laughs> about that it's 5 a.m. It's got, <laughs> it's got to be the bad side of town. I mean, they're throwing a football around. <laughs> I, well, I just have to know if there is a good side of town. Yeah, I know. I'm starting to wonder about Miami. I mean, except for when you're on the water. <laughs> True. You live on the water, you're you're nice. But if you don't live on the water, you're screwed. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I just love how Crockett's complaining because it's early in the morning. It's like it's five at fifteen. This is indecent. It, it's like, gee, man, some people do, you know, actually work. They go yeah. to work. <laughs> I also have a couple questions here. Lots of things happen in the first 50 seconds of this episode. <laughs> no, it's like, let me get this all out now. <laughs> first, they come pulling up on the best side of town in his Ferrari. Second, there's a couple of guys playing football. It turns out they are undercover cops that are meeting the duo there. But I have a question for Tubbs. First, he mentions someone named Camille. Who is Camille? And didn't his very recent girlfriend get shot on an island with him just a couple of weeks ago? He left her on the island. She was all <laughs> shot up. Because her name was Alicia. Maybe it was Alicia oh. Camille. All right. No. <laughs> so who's Camille? I was I thinking her know. name was Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> well, he almost got to, what did he say? He almost got to. Yeah, that's my next question. Small. It's, it's 5.15 a.m. And T- Crock is complaining about how early it is. And Tubbs says, quote, Camille and I were this close to the promised land, and then my beeper went off. So, hey, Tubbs. Uh, why does it take you so long? <laughs> five in the morning. What's happening at five in the morning at the Tubbs house? <laughs> the Tubbs house. Wow. <laughs> Baby Tubbs just doesn't sleep. That's why we always see him in such a great mood in the mornings. Crockett's all dragging ass well, every uh, morning, and Tubbs is like wearing his suit, whistling down the street. He's having sex at 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> That's why in, in Tubbs in Tubbs defense, we don't necessarily know if he has a home. He might be homeless. He might just be having <laughs> sex just to be under in someone's house. <laughs> True. <laughs> Well, the two men, as I mentioned, they're undercover cops. They're waiting for the duo. They start walking down towards the Nemo Hotel. And they're explaining to the duo that they can make a bust on these guys because they stole some quote unquote ghetto blasters. They have a warrant to break into the to the apartment or hotel room. Oh, it's kind of flimsy, but this person might have information on who witnessed a murder. Over under is ghetto blasters racist. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say over. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> just I'm um, just curious. <laughs> also noticed in that scene, did did Crockett pull rank on these guys? Pretty much, because they flip a coin, and he also tells Tubbs that he's got the gimpy knee, and so he can't go up the stairs, so he just kind of hangs out on the street while Tubbs and the other two cops go do the real work. He's got the, he also says that they have a gold badge, which you have to get a special, you have to take a special test to get the detective gold badge. They're just rookies. They're not detectives. They're just policemen. They're mm. different. And that's what he says. Like, you don't have the gold badge. This... And they're like, we're going to take the test. <laughs> mm-hmm. th- th- is it a pure test? Like, how did Crockett pass it? <laughs> um, because he's a weathered veteran, okay? <laughs> he probably wrote the test that they have to take. Mm-hmm. C- can we just talk about who these two undercover cops are for a minute? We have Detective Bobby Diaz, who is played by Lou Diamond Phillips. The, the wonderful Lou Diamond Phillips. <laughs> but he was actually born Lou Diamond Upchurch. And if you asked me which one of those names, uh, of his three names, are made up, I would not have <laughs> guessed Phillips. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so he was born on Supig Bay Naval Station in the Philippines. His big break was in 1987 with the movie La Bamba, playing Richie Valens. He was also in both the Young Guns movies. He got nominated for, I want to uh, believe, an Oscar for Courage Under Fire. And, you know, I mean, I just picked out the two most TV episodes that he was in. He did 20 episodes of Reoccurring on Stargate and 53 episodes of the television show Longmire, which I believe is like a Showtime show. Our second detective is Detective Eddie Trumbull, played by Vigo Mortensen, who actually, leading up to his vice appearance, he really was kind of unknown. He was in a George Washington miniseries. He was in an ABC After School special. (laughs) Okay, I need to see that. (laughs) And then, uh, then a TV show called Search for Tomorrow, and then Vice. 
And then, boom, his movie career would exp- he, with uh, his first appearance in the movie Witness. He would join oh, really? Diamond Phillips in Young Guns 2. He would also be in Carlito's Way, 98 version of Psycho. And then what most people know him from is he plays Aragorn in, in the Lord of the Rings franchise. He's like anyone that's in it any Marvel movies now like that's, yeah, that's forever true. that's all that they're going to be known for so like Robert Hitt Downey Jr. What he, did, what he did before what he's going to do after doesn't matter he's always Iron Man Viggo Mortensen has been in yep. a bunch of great movies since Lord of the Rings mm-hmm. he's Aragon yep yeah also on a side note he's written 17 books of poetry painting and photography between 93 and 2010 it's a good thing we don't get too used to Viggo Mortensen in this episode <laughs> So Trumbull, Diaz, and Tubbs all head upstairs. They're going to go kick in the door on this hotel room. They're going to make their arrest. And Vigo lines up like he's going to kick in the door. Trumbull, he lines up like he's going to kick in the door. And as soon as he does it, the door is rigged with an explosive on one of the ghetto blasters. Actually, you can see it on the screen (laughs) when when they show the explosion. And it blows Trumbull straight back. He's got shrapnel all over him. Tubbs orders... Diaz, his partner, go run and get help while I stay here with your partner. Because he was hurt too. Because he got he got some stuff. Croc is outside, just kind of picking his nose. He was standing there, ready to go. <laughs> he looked down the hallway to see what all the fuss was about. He ran in as soon as it happened. <laughs> and then we roll to the opening credits. When we come no. back for credits, our episode is being narrated by Sonny Crockett. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I just kind of sat around. I don't know. I heard some stuff upstairs. It sounded pretty serious. (laughs) I'm pretty sure he's not going to make it, though. (laughs) Castillo shows up. man. Keep keep it to yourself. (laughs) Yeah, I know. He does say, yeah, it's not looking good. Like, great way to be optimistic. (laughs) Castillo shows up with a gentleman named Vic Farnell, who's a special investigations. And Diaz, they come into the hotel. And Switek is talking to Diaz, and Diaz, he's telling him, like, you're going to be okay, but your case is pretty cut up. And then he starts talking to Castillo and Varnell, and they start talking about Diaz in the third person. He's like, he's right there, man. He's is right he okay? There. Can he answer some questions? Like, well, he's pretty banged up. He's going to need some stitches. Like, because apparently Switek is also a nurse now. He can do exterminating, and he can hatch up people's bandages. Yeah. <laughs> Varnell says they'll talk to Diaz later, but he wants to talk to Tubbs. And when Varnell starts talking to Tubbs, Tubbs is immediately really worked up. He is hopping mad. Well, Varnell's a jerk, first of all. Like, right off the bat, he has an attitude. He's like, yeah, is he all right to talk or what? Like, talk about the guy that's been blown up. <laughs> Tubbs is losing it, Jack. Like, why at all rice? <laughs> I love him throwing the line out there. Just gets all worked up and starts throwing that stuff out there. Calling people Jack. <laughs> he is pissed. More pissed than we've ever seen Tubbs. And he's a fiery guy. He gets worked up pretty easily. <laughs> <laughs> he's pacing around. He's pointing people in their chest. You know, he's foaming at the mouth a little bit as he's pacing around. He, he back wants and forth. his money. He even lays into Castillo a little bit. And he is convinced that someone is leaking search warrants because there's been two other cops that have been set up on warrants that have been killed. But And this was the third. And so now there's like a, there's a total trend here that something is happening inside of their department. And he is pissed and he is pissed that Miami PD just lets this happen. And he is done with Miami Vice. He's quitting. He's done. He's out. I want my money. <laughs> yes. There, there, there's a rat in vice and he wants his money. Because in New York, they wouldn't put up with this. Yeah. He did say that. Like in New York, they wouldn't be doing this. They wouldn't be sending us out with this. They had to take care of it already. And it gets so serious between him and Castillo that Castillo says, you can work another case or you're suspended. And Tubbs says, better yet, I quit. Like that's how he, does. That's he says, how I quit this bitch. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, so <Nope>. happy. <laughs> now, granted, granted, I knew something was afoot. I would just say, put put it out like that. I knew there was something weird going on. Because I did not think that Tubbs was really quitting the Vice Squad. And Melissa, you mentioned too that he, because he got so worked up so fast, this can't be normal Tubbs. Like people should know there's something wrong here. 
Yeah, because he was like right off the bat, he just flew off the handle. He's seen many people get blown up. <laughs> He's been the problem, and then the, <laughs> the reason why they died, he didn't get yeah. that worked up. <laughs> Remember when that uh, especially teenager because got killed? He keeps repeating, he keeps repeating the same things. He keeps repeating, "We wouldn't put up with this in New York. I want my money. Exactly. I'm going to go back to New York." You know, he keeps repeating the same story, like he's memor, like he memorized a story, like in Reservoir Dogs. He's got a story. <laughs> <laughs> when Switek takes Diaz outside, he p- puts him in an ambulance. And this is when we first meet Special Investigator McIntyre, who comes in, sees the argument between Tubbs and Varnell and Castillo, and sees that Castillo, is, or not Castillo, but he sees that Tubbs has quit. And then my favorite part of this whole scene is then when it's all said and done, Tubbs is done leaving the force in style. Some other random cop just comes walking up, solemnly looks at all of them with no emotion and says, Trumbull has died. Well, you had the scene. You could have had better timing. <laughs> yes. He yes. waited there too. He watched it all unfold. Like, well, that guy quit. I guess I should th- this is when I should say it. He did. Oh my god. It, it felt like such like a mash style <laughs> notification. You, you, you know, like he just kind of walks in. Trumbull has died. Scene. And you know, like I, I know we're making a little bit light of Tubbs's performance here of him being angry, but what after watching it, I was stoked. I was so pumped. I was like, fuck yeah, let's do this. <laughs> Get him Tubbs. Like. Angry Tubbs is the best. <laughs> and it continues on because he is serious about getting his money. <laughs> he goes straight down to the bank and tries to pull his money, and the lady behind the counter is not helping him. Like, listen. There's a procedure. You got to read the stuff on the wall. Get out of my face. I got better stuff to do. And Tubbs says, oh, this this on the wall here. Then picks up a chair and smashes in the windows. <laughs> and she calls security. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, get him, Rico. <laughs> I was so amped after these two scenes. <laughs> it's, it's my favorite Tubbs moment now. It's him smashing that window at the bank. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's wanting to do it at one point. No? <laughs> He's just screaming, I want my money. I want it now. <laughs> Down at the hospital, Castillo was talking to Diaz. And another cop comes up and says that Tubbs has been arrested. And Castillo says, call Crockett. That's his problem. <laughs> call Detective Crockett. He'll okay. deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about what Dad's saying to Diaz? I mean, he's basically trying to, in a very polite, polite way, say like, "Grow a pair." <laughs> <laughs> he's sp- specifically telling Diaz, "You stay out of this investigation. You are not needed in this. You are not in the right frame of mind. This isn't best for you to be a part of this. So stay out of it." In order to honor your partner's legacy, you should continue on the way you guys were going, which was good. Police officers don't get involved in this, or. We have some really big plan that we want you to stay out of because you could mess it up because you're not in the know. And you're not that bright, yes. clearly. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you know? <laughs> Still <laughs> may have known something. Now we have this really fast scene down at the Justice Department. And it's a man he calls and talks to a secretary. And she mentions to him, he's clearly a cop because you see the badge. But I don't know. Do you see that it's McIntyre? Yeah, you do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it definitely is McIntyre. I I wasn't sure at first if you could see his face long enough to be able to know that it's McIntyre. No, it's it's definitely McIntyre. Okay. Well, he's talking to her and she mentions to McIntyre. Did you hear what happened to Tubbs? She like wigged out. He's been arrested. And McIntyre says, oh, sweet. Then give me all the information on him. And then we go back over to the precinct. By the way, Sir Glenn McIntyre, played by Scott Plank. Scott Plank, actually, he was in a few movies. He was in Wired. He was in Mr. Baseball. Also did a little bit of TV. He was on 12 episodes of Melrose Place. He was on 26 episodes of Air America. And, well, the reason I bring it up is he appeared in the TV film L.A. Takedown, written and directed by the one and only Michael Mann. In everything. And you know what's interesting about Scott Plank's background is that a ton of stuff that he was in involves various people from Vice. Like they guest starred in it or they had a recurring role or something mm-hmm. like that. So I know, I think when I was reading on him that he appeared in Crime Story. Mm-hmm. The Vice family takes care of their own. They definitely oh, sit yeah. together. 
By the way, L.A. Takedown was cons- is best known as a small-scale version of one of his more famous films, Heat. Well, so it was kind of like pre-stage to what eventually would become that. Well, unfortunately, Scott Plank uh, passed away in 2002 in a car crash. I don't know how to follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> I know, we're like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Back at the Miami police station, Crockett is trying to talk Tubbs down. And, and actually, this is really interesting as we find out at the end of the episode who was all involved. Because it makes you feel like Crockett doesn't know at this point that there's this secret plan. Because otherwise, why would they keep up this charade in this secret room? Now, there's, there is an, uh, another officer in there, but... I don't think he had to be in there like they could have had one of the people who was on the inside and then do this whole scene this makes me think that crockett didn't know what was happening yet i also so realized what you're saying is that either crockett doesn't know or then they planned this whole scene as a performance for some random cop <laughs> yeah they i think i think he knew and they planned it all i think all the thing was supposed to he had to he had to do something big in public that's why he wouldn't smash everything up so we'll get back and then they have these reports of yeah. they, like hung interview. out after work and practiced this <laughs> no i just think they're that good <laughs> I also realized in this scene that Tubbs' clothes is covered in blood from the crime scene in the open. Yeah, he's still covered in blood. When he went into the bank when he got arrested and they said, we're not going to give you his money, you didn't look at his clothing and saw all the blood and go, maybe we should give this man his money. Well, they said because he had an outstanding <laughs> loan, that's what he couldn't. Where, what did he have the loan for? What, why does he, he have a loan? <laughs> he doesn't have a house. <laughs> What's he got a loan for? Trying to buy another Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> If this is staged, this is a really intense conversation between Tubbs and Crockett. He wants to go back to New York to become a P.I. Does that mean that Ricardo Tubbs wants to be in Moonlighting now? <laughs> is that what I'm getting? Also, the, the guard is very weird. <laughs> Can we get over that part, too? <laughs> he just comes oh over. Oh, my God. <laughs> when it's all done, the random cop comes up to Crockett and it's like, he looks like he's too far gone. I'd give up. He's like, or maybe he'll come back on his own, but I don't think he will. Well, thanks for your opinion, Jack. Who asked you? <laughs> I, I just look he's standing in the background he, he looks seriously looks disappointed in yeah, Tubbs. and then when Tubbs and then when Tubbs leaves he comes over and kind of gives Crockett the hey like hey buddy <laughs> hey sorry how you doing <laughs> This is, You'll get another partner. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what my thought is, is that Crockett didn't know at this time because the next scene, it feels like Switek didn't know what was happening either because there's there's literally no one else in this scene. It's just the two of them. It's in the evening. Yes. Tubbs is packing up his stuff and le- leaving the precinct. And Switek is like, hey, buddy, like, you okay? And Tubbs says, quote, you're a trained observer, right? Why don't you just worry about the six inches in front of your own nose? I feel like that Switek did not know because you can't tell everybody. Everybody can't know. But remember, at the end, Switek is the one that comes in doing the reports for Castillo. But at one point, someone has to tell him. But right now, I think I think if if you want to be honest, in the, the people that were in the know right now have got to be Crockett. Castillo and Tubbs. Crockett couldn't. So hold there's on, no hold way on, he could on. not know. They have to have. They'd have to have him involved in it. They couldn't go on without him. Like, he'd have to know. We're back into this situation again. Either Switek knows, and this is all, and, and this exchange <laughs> between them is for absolutely nothing because there's no one else in the room. Other than Tubbs laying the smackdown on him just one time. <laughs> yeah. I don't think, I or, really don't think, go ahead. <laughs> or he's just throwing shade at, at, at Switek and poor Switek, nobody loves him. <laughs> I know. He even talks about, he like, don't you think that when the, I felt that way when Larry died? get out of here and throw it all in but i did see that's why i think it, he didn't know at that point i think later on he was let in which is why i think that crockett didn't know then either they just never say later when they do yeah, maybe tell you're right. them yeah you're probably right but that's screwed up because this is the only time he like one of the only times that he ever brings up larry after post larry Yep, so, he never like, brings them up. Well, Tubbs just like crushing him, just like <laughs> ruin all that for him. Larry definitely comes up in season five, but mm. yeah, but they don't really talk about him after that, yeah. Yeah, but there's no other officers in the precinct at that time. It's just them two. Yeah, so. I know. I think, I think he didn't know. And that, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe Crockett didn't know. And at one point, he told, they told everybody, like, hey, okay, this is going on. Because I mean, he did ask. Why tech. <laughs> I know. He did act really, <laughs> Crockett did act really disappointed, right? Like at the end of it, he was like, really like, I don't know what's going on. I've known him for three years and I've never yeah. seen him like this. It's that Tubbs and Castillo are operating on their own right now. 
True, because they, they couldn't tell everybody. bring other people in. Yeah. yeah. So well, next I mean, at least Crockett has the guard to cry on his shoulder. You know, <laughs> poor Zwitek's all by himself, just crushed in the bullpen. <laughs> <laughs> That night, Tubbs decides he's going to go to the club and he's going to try and get a loan from a loan shark. Because that's one of the things in the conversation with Crockett is he says, if if Miami PD won't pay me, then I'll go get it off the street. And so he heads over to this Dude. bar to try and set up a loan shark deal. And that and McIntyre comes in and starts talking to him. Yeah. So it, Tubbs, this whole episode is pretty much every other sentence is, I need my money. <laughs> so whatever he has got going on, he needs his money now. He needs it. So, and I bad. just, yeah, that's just love. The, the tender at the club is kind of laughing at him. Tubbs is giving them, I'm not a cop anymore. So, it's okay to loan me money. I can do illegal things now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Tubbs storms out on McIntyre, who's there to come talk to him about, like, I have this proposition for you. Are you really out? And Tubbs is like, Get out of here, sucker. And he leaves the club. McIntyre then follows him shortly after and starts walking down the street. And as he's walking down the street, I'm like, Tubbs is going to be in an alley. Tubbs, <laughs> Tubbs is going to take care of some business right now. And sure enough, as McIntyre is walking down, Tubbs grabs him and holds him at gunpoint <laughs> in that alley. And I'm like, yes, this is the Tubbs I love. <laughs> <laughs> McIntyre then tells him that he can set him up where in four months he could retire with six figures in the bank. He's even got room for Crockett. All he needs is to pass along information to McIntyre, and McIntyre will be the one that'll pay him. So that's it, right? McIntyre confessed. Episode over. Tubbs got his guy. You would think, but as we find out later, they want the person who's on the inside. I mean, we'll come back to this later. I just think, like, if not now that they know that it's McIntyre, maybe they should investigate him personally and find out that his girlfriend also works at the Justice Department. That seems like important information that police officers will find out pretty early. And you then think. go figure out what she's mm -hmm. up to. People were detectives. You know. <laughs> These are gold shields. Well, I'm just saying, about. <laughs> though. If you arrest him and you open an investigation, you're going to find out about his girlfriend. And then you'll have to interrogate him. And then you'll find out. Well, let's just keep going with the episode. <laughs> I mean, we already started it this way. You My know? biggest question is, why would McIntyre so quickly decide to work with Tubbs? Because he was angry and he smashed things up and he got arrested. But he's angry because the Miami PD is so dirty. <laughs> yeah, but he also who needs his money. <laughs> yeah, he also just said like he that Tubbs said he was willing to go to a loan shark. In other words, he thinks that Tubbs is not as clean as he makes it out to be. True. Well, the next morning we have a really fast scene at the precincts where the department heads and spe special investigations is telling the vice team. Uh, keep doing your job. Don't talk to the press. And also, we have extra body bags. We're not going to give you any protection. If you feel uncomfortable, we'll have extra help there for you. We'll have extra body bags for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, out on a boat, McIntyre is meeting with someone named Avila. And this is who he's selling the information about the active search warrants. And they just have a quick conversation about tubs and what he might be able to do. And Abel's like, yeah, I mean, I'll give you all the money in the world. If you can sw if you can get this guy to start giving us information. I'd like to point out one, once again, people wearing suits on boats is weird. <laughs> what is wrong with you, Miami? I, I always think that too. I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm going to go out for yeah. a day on my boat in my three piece suit. <laughs> yes. That will never not be weird. Miami. I also want to point out that McIntyre, it's not too, thrilled with the fact that uh, Vila is kind of talking town to him like well I will meet Tubbs and I will deal with Tubbs and you know I will deal directly with him you know he's like well I I, I could handle it yeah I, McIntyre really works hard to make sure he's always in the middle of this and he leaves from the Avila meeting and goes down the street to talk to Tubbs and he gets a file from him, but he's like, no, this isn't enough. Um, also, I want all the information you can get on Avila down at the station, too. I love Tubbs' response. That's a lot of paper, man. Like, that's a lot of printing. And normally, Trudy does that stuff. <laughs> I don't even know uh, how to do she that. She doesn't stuff. know about this. <laughs> Which means that Trudy is the one that gave him the file. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he's undercover, that's how she got called into this. <laughs> he's like, listen, he tells us to you, I don't know how to do any of that. I need Trudy. Well, we got to, we got to let her in. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, we need to read someone in who can work the fax machine. <laughs> Later that night, out at McIntyre's place, he's there with his girlfriend. And his girlfriend is not about what McIntyre is 
doing and how these cops are getting killed. But she really likes the money, and so does McIntyre. So they kind of agree at the end of the conversation, yeah, we'll keep doing this. It'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. She keeps on him, can't go on like this forever. And he, he he's like, nah, baby, everything's great. Everything's going to be beautiful. <laughs> Take care of us. We're going to buy an island. <laughs> by the way, the girlfriend, Vicky, played by Annette Benning. Annette Benning, she's a massively famous actress. And she's been in a bunch of great movies. She, Her first movie was actually The Great Outdoors in 1988, which is great comedy. It's one of my favorite John Candy movies, and then also one of my favorite comedy movies. And family movies. It's uh-huh. like perfect yeah, it's all just, around. It's perfect, perfect. She would do the movie The Grifters and receive an Oscar nomination. She would ultimately lose to Whoopi Goldberg. That was her first Oscar nomination now stay with me uh, <laughs> she would do the movie bugsy where she would meet her husband warren Beatty. and i'm skipping some movies in between projects in between i'm just jumping to the milestones she would do mars attacks the siege she would do american beauty which she would get her second oscar nomination for best actress but she would lose to Hillary Swank that time. She would do Being Julia, which would be her third Oscar nomination for Best Actress. She would again lose to Hillary Swank. And then she would do The The Kids Are All Right, which would be her fourth nomination for Best Actress, this time losing to Natalie Portman. (laughs) So I guess, I I, I guess, uh, fifth time's done. She's getting Newman. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Don't Come get on, me Oscar, started on give that. A break. <laughs> <laughs> that night at McIntyre's, he's talking to his girlfriend. They got it all worked out. Over at Metro Dade, Diaz is working late, typing out his reports. So he just stumbles on tubs with a flashlight in the filing cabinets. Not suspicious at <laughs> I'm all. I'm not doing nothing. <laughs> Diaz goes right for the juggler, though. He calls Tubbs a coward, says he's backing out as weak. He knows why he's backing out. It even causes a small scuffle and then calls Tubbs a punk. A kerfuffle? (laughs) (laughs) And then after Tubbs leaves, Diaz goes back into the filing cabinet and he sees what file Tubbs took. And so now he really, really thinks Tubbs is dirty. Well, yeah. What else is he supposed to think? (laughs) You would think that they would bring him in on this deal right now. Well, you know, you can't see into the future. (laughs) You don't know he's going to try and mess everything up. (laughs) Or maybe not. I don't know. Maybe he didn't mess everything up. (laughs) Later, Tubbs calls McIntyre and tells him he's got the files. And he also mentions that Vice is going to hit Avila's warehouse on Canal Street tomorrow. But Tubbs really wants his money. (laughs) (laughs) Where's my money? (laughs) McIntyre's like, just be patient. my money. You'll get paid tomorrow. And Tubbs is like, no, where's my money? Now. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, Crockett and some beefcake. <laughs> You're like, who's that beefcake? <laughs> That's what he asked me when we were watching. I'm like, I don't know. Some man, guy. That was, that was a handsome man. I'm just saying. <laughs> he's, he's throwing some competition at Crockett. I'm just, no, you know, no, just saying. no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> he's tall. Anyways, anyways I'm getting distracted. <laughs> Crockett and his new partner, who's who he's going to get killed, and plus some Metro Dade officers, go to this canal. Avila and McIntyre are watching from across the water. Crockett throws open the door, and his new dead partner goes running in. He gets shot by a shotgun that's staged on the other side of the door because, of course, Avila and McIntyre know that there was a warrant that was going to happen on this building, so they set up ahead of time to kill another police officer. Tubbs. I'm thinking right now, did Tubbs get another officer killed? Yes. Fake killed. <laughs> He's dead. And Crockett <laughs> seems doesn't seem too shocked by it. Well, he that's why he didn't go in first. Yeah, He's just kinda... seen so many dead partners. Like <laughs> <laughs> I only had this one for a day. Damn God. Yeah. Damn it. Lost he, another one. And he was so handsome, I could have got so many women with him. <laughs> He's a very cartoon style shot too. Like the door opens and he jumps up and f- back in the air, you know, like legs and arms straight out. And I would say there's no blood, and that should be a warning sign. But when everyone else gets shot, there's no blood either. So it's all you can't show good. blood on TV. Mm-hmm. So then later, when the police show up and the ambulance shows up to get his partner, they load him into the ambulance. He's not dead, but they load him into the ambulance. And he turns out he's wearing a vest and he's he's in on this. And the ladies are in the ambulance with him. And he's complaining about the blanks being too hard and that it was a good thing. It was blanks, though. And the ladies are saying that, well, the bomb squad came in late last night. They had to work really fast. 
because they didn't get the call until after 1 a.m. They had to wait like all night for Avila's guys to leave. That way they could go back in there and re-rig the shotgun with the blanks. And then he also asked so, Gina to grant him his dying wish. Pervert. In their conversation, they say, oh, we're only waiting for search warrants, wiretaps, and a meeting location to come through. Just a couple things. Just a few. <laughs> we're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're almost wait, waiting for the entire investigation. <laughs> At the docks, Tubbs is waiting for the call from McIntyre to find out where the meet's at. And you can see in the distance that Diaz is watching. And so now it's like, uh... Yeah, somebody tell him. <laughs> someone please tell Diaz. Because he really thinks Tubbs is crooked. Tubbs get the call and McIntyre says the deal has to happen right now. Not tonight. Not tomorrow morning. Right now, right now. Drop everything that you're doing. We have to do this right now. So now it's getting weird with the timelines. When did people find out? When did Crockett find out? That this was happening because he didn't have a strong response to his new partner being shot. Oh, yeah. He knew the ladies were in on the inside. We go back to the precinct and Switek comes in with the assistant attorney general and they got their wiretaps. Garcia says he wants everyone who's working the case not to move until they know who McIntyre's source is. And Switek gives them the rundown of like, these are all the people that are working on. These are the people who know. So now Switek is totally in the know. Yeah. He he knows more than more than anyone else. We are missing one important part of this conversation when the ADA says, oh, yeah. Yeah, and Tubbs' covers probably blown. Uh, are bad. Oops, <laughs> sorry about that. Castillo says, "Well, Tubbs knew the risk." Yeah, I know. Castillo's yeah. like so nonchalant. <laughs> <laughs> he never apologized for Larry either. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Larry could have been dirty. <laughs> <laughs> and then Tubbs calls, and he tells him that the meet's going to happen right now. And the assistant state attorney says. This is bad. They the the warrants in the system. That means his source inside the Justice Department probably knows. That means he knows. Everyone is nervous. And Cassio's like, "Well, it's your call, Tubbs." <laughs> I can't stop Whatever you anyway. You do. It's not like I'm your boss or anything. <laughs> yeah, Tubbs sounded real nervous on the, in that phone call too. Hey, uh, uh, I don't know what to do. They want to do this thing like right now. I wish I had. I don't some know backup. where I am. <laughs> yes. I'm not angry Tubbs anymore. Here, Tubbs. <laughs> Obviously, the concern is he knows, and now Tubbs is going to get killed, or he doesn't know, and they'll get their source. But they got to get the source. That's the whole part of it. That's the reason for this whole deal. And they don't want to cut a deal. I can arrest McIntyre now, then cut a deal with him so he gets off. Well, yeah, because Tubbs doesn't even want to do that. That's that's the whole point. Meanwhile, at the Justice Department, McIntyre's girlfriend finally sees that there's a warrant for. McIntyre. So she calls him on the car phone who has Tubbs with him with Avila and he gets made. Tubbs is now it's out there. And so they hold him at gunpoint. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Back at the Justice Department, the team has busted the girlfriend because they saw the call logs and they saw that she called him. And it's just back to like, they think they should have known to investigate her. But anyways, that's a different story. They can't find McIntyre, though. They don't know where he's at. It's going to take Switek a long time to triangulate the phone call. So they have no idea where Tubbs at. They have no idea where McIntyre's at. They can't find him. And the girlfriend again, won't talk. Fantastic planning by the Vice Squad. <laughs> Mostly Castillo. <laughs> this is all on his shoulders. He should have never yeah. let this ever happen. Well, we'll figure it out later. We'll figure it out. They, they, they won't want to meet until at least tonight. I mean, why? <laughs> so now we're going to go to the second to last scene because there's one. It, this is the last place in the episode. There's two scenes here. Soft Rock just does not fit this scene. <laughs> <laughs> McIntyre goes down to meet his contact. He's He wants to get his money before they take care of Tubbs. Nearby, Diaz is watching I from the dog house. his money. <laughs> <laughs> Diaz calls Crockett and says he found the leak and come get the bodies. And he hangs up before Crockett has a chance to say, Tubbs is not crooked. Please do not kill my partner. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he All did right. it on purpose. <laughs> All right. So stop real quick. I want to say at this point, Point. We meet this guy with a fantastic mustache and white man perm. <laughs> he, he doesn't talk. He just opens the door and he's playing the bodyguard for a villa. His name is Mark Br- Brummer. I bring it up because this is his only acting appearance. And he now practices law as part of the <laughs> Brummer and Brummer law firm in Miami. So if you're <laughs> injured, if you're oh. injured, call Brummer and Brummer. You might have a case. <laughs> he, he'll tell you about his time he met Crockett. 
<laughs> Dude, did you see that fantastic? He's got the thin white guy mustache, and he's got like the curly, um, <laughs> the, the, the like the white perm. <laughs> So now they get Tubbs out of the car. He's surrounded. They take him down to the boat with McIntyre. You can see on Tubbs' face, he's like, I'm doomed. But out of nowhere, Diaz comes running down the dock and Crockett comes flying up. And holy crap, did Crockett get across town fast? That's why he's got that car. <laughs> Diaz comes so. running down the dock. He starts shooting at Avila and McIntyre and Tubbs. Tubbs jumps into a boat. Diaz shoots and kills Avila. Crockett then kills a guard. Tubbs is still hanging out in the boat, just covering his head. Praying. <laughs> <laughs> McIntyre pops out and kills Diaz. And then backup shows up. So now so, McIntyre is the only one left there. And there's Miami PD all over the place. And he decides, well, you know what? It was fun while it lasted. And he just pull, pulls the gun on himself and commits suicide. Because there's something about Crockett that makes no. all the suspects <laughs> commit suicide. Yes. I was going to say, this has nothing to do with him, you know, <laughs> wanting to commit suicide. Crockett does this thing with his eyes when he looks at you that makes you want to shoot yourself in front of him. It's a disappointment. Um, he has disappointment yeah, in his eyes. It, it happened to that judge a few seasons back. It, it, it's happening again. <laughs> um, it would have happened to the wheelchair guy too but he couldn't do it <laughs> I think he was drunk <laughs> I was sweating bullets through this entire scene I was I thought he was doomed and then DS shows up and it starts to shoot out I really thought this was the time where we're going to see Tubbs get obviously not killed but, but like hurt he was going to get hurt real bad well I, mm -hmm. I think we need to give Diaz credit for being the most elaborate death on Miami Vice <laughs> he was like shooting and like falling and there was no bullets in him and then he was writhing on the ground I think Lou Diamond Phelps was the best death we've ever had sorry best actor <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> I, I don't know Wes, Wesley Snipes was pretty bad remember? oh yeah that's true that is true yeah <laughs> No, I mean, like, I'm being so, serious. Like, it was like he was going for an Oscar on this thing. I was actually disappointed that he ended up dead at the end of this because I was hoping for, like, a Diamond Lou spinoff, you know? I know. Why, Diaz, why did Diaz, the red cop, a cop with a heart of gold. <laughs> like I was saying, I was really nervous for how this, and especially how this built up and when I finally realized, because mostly you've seen this episode before, but this is the first time I'd seen it, and it finally clicked, like, oh, crap, this was the plan all along, and Tubbs actually did a really good job of selling this. He did such a good job that he was almost murdered by a, by a Metro Dade police officer. They really did their homework on this, and it's credit to Tubbs on the risk that he was willing to take. He was almost murdered twice. <laughs> by him <laughs> and then almost by the, the crooks, too. And Tubbs does so, try to I say to Diaz before he dies like he tries to tell him that he's not dirty but Diaz dies before he has a chance to do that and that's what bugs Tubbs at the end of our last moments of this episode where yeah. he says that's where he so, feels the worst yeah so the swamp cops roll in as backup you know late as usual <laughs> um, the scene ends with them wheeling out Diaz's body and was that, am I mistaken did he put did Tubbs give his badge and put it on Diaz yeah because it's dead body like, yeah, because like, it's a gold he, badge. Yeah, it's Tubbs' badge. Gotcha. Like, oh, I'm going to need that back before you... Uh, no, <laughs> yeah, so is he still planning on going to New York to be a PI? Um, or <laughs> or is it, is, does he still need money for that? <laughs> we, while we're watching it, I realized there's another person on that boat still. Like, McIntyre commits suicide. <laughs> there's still one person on that boat. <laughs> See, I told you, though, he died in the most dramatic fashion, like shooting in the, <laughs> into the dock and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so after Tubbs puts that puts his badge on Diaz's body, the episode ends. And the only thing, the last thing I'll say here is that Crockett tries to talk to Tubbs and tell him, like, hey, I know this is bad. And this is something that's been consistent in Vice that they always have to deal with is that it feels like everything went wrong, but the good guys won. And unfortunately, this is the way the good guys feel because it doesn't it's not always perfect. Yeah. Yeah. But usually you would hope not to have two dead cops by the end of it. I, I don't think we can chalk that up as a win. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I mean, that's they're back to in a corner. That's the only way that they can sleep at night, essentially, is well, that yeah. know that they are making that sure they cops die. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they don't have time to prevent it. Okay. 
They just don't want to feel sorry about it. <laughs> <laughs> they had to be creative with this one. Well, let's go talk about the music in this episode. Although uh, we have two songs from one band, it is a band worth the conversation. So let's go talk about this week in music. All right, John, I mentioned that we have two songs from one band, and I saw the band, and I'm like, I cannot wait for this one, actually, because I know nothing about this band. All right, so we have Money Talks and Closer to Heaven, both songs by the Alan Parsons Project. The Alan Parsons Project is a British progressive rock band that existed between 1975 and 1990. It consisted pretty much primarily of Alan Parsons and Eric Wolfson, and then just plethora of other guys, of other musicians who would rotate into the band over the years. Alan Parsons and uh, Eric Wolfson, they actually met in the canteen of abbey road studios yeah. uh yeah the abbey road in the summer of 1974 you see parsons had been working as an assistant engineer on the beatles abbey road album from 69 and the beatles let it be album from 70 and he had just finished engineering pink floyd's dark side of the moon album which was released in 73 Damn. Yeah. So at that time, Wilson was singer, songwriter, composer, who was working for the studio as a session p- pianist. Essentially, these guys met in 74 while they were working on these just incredible, you know, massive albums. And in their time on the side, they were working on this thing, this Edgar Allan Poe project. They started messing with these other things. They, they experimented with, uh, like, film industry themed music and, and stuff, like, inspired by Kubrick. And it pretty much involved a bunch of different session musicians and a bunch of different names and ultimately led to... The two of them teaming up and releasing their first album on, as the Alan Parsons Project called Tales of Mystery and Imagination in 1976. So Tales of Mystery and Imagination, it would be pretty successful. It would mostly be successful in the U.S. as we reach the top 40 on the Billboard chart. And that seems to be the thing with the Alan Parsons Project is that they were very popular in America and in continental Europe, but they weren't very popular in the U.K. where they were from. They actually didn't have any top 40 singles or, or albums in the U.K. That's kind of a weird scenario. Yeah, usually it's the other way around, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And especially when you, when they were pretty much working in studios with, you know, Pink Floyd and the Beatles, like the biggest bands from the UK, they really had most of their success in America. In the late 70s, early 80s, they would continue to see success all the way until 1984's Don't Answer Me became their last successful single in the US, but still reaching the top 15. Pretty much by the 90s, they'd fizzled out. 87's Gotti would be their last project. They planned another album called Freudiana, uh, that was supposed to be released in 1990, but event- but Wolfson would end up turning that into more of a musical, and uh, because of the difference of directions they were heading, that would actually lead to them pretty much disbanding by the 90s. Alan Parsons would continue on and have a solo career. Wolfson would go on to produce three musicals based on the music of the Alan Parsons project, Fordia, Gotti, and The Gambler. Alan Parsons, by the way, if you wonder why he got top billing in the band, well, when he joined the band, he actually declined Pink Floyd's invitation to work on the follow-up to Dark Side of the Moon, the album Wish You Were Here. Uh, instead, Damn. he decided to work on the Alan Parsons Project. Pretty wow. much from the end of the Alan Parsons Project to now, he has still been producing and working behind the scenes and still touring and doing and putting on shows. So I mentioned that I didn't really know that much about the Alan Parsons Project, but it turns out Alan Parsons has been an integral part of my favorite music. He is deeply involved with a lot of it. <laughs> it's weird, but there's going to be a somewhat of a theme here. But I feel like, like how do you top, how do you top working with Pink Floyd and the Beatles? Well, our next song is Best Adventures by Think Man. You know, Think Man, a gigantic band or... <laughs> exactly you never heard of him who the hell is <laughs> yeah. think man well, think they? man <laughs> is the brainchild is the brainchild of rupert hein who's rupert hein rupert hein is an english musician singer songwriter and record producer and so i'm just gonna break his biography down by decades 
In the early 60s, time with half of the duo, Rupert and Dave. They performed mostly in pubs and clubs, with occasionally being joined on stage by a then-unknown Paul Simon. Wow. And they, they would only release one single, and it would be a cover of Paul Simon's 1965 hit, Sounds of Silence. They would not see any success from it, but they did feature a young Jimmy Page on guitar. No way. Yes. Yes, Robert Hine inter- he- was hanging out with Paul Simon and Jimmy Page before they were anybody. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Let's jump to the 70s. So in the 70s, Hine released two solo albums under his own name. One would be Pick a Bone in 1971 and Unfinished Picture in 1973. He would then form a band called Quantum Jump. They would release (laughs) albums in 76 and 77. So by the way, when I just state that they released an album and I don't follow it up with, and it was blank, blank, blank on billboard blank chart, it usually means like it didn't suck. It made a little money. <laughs> they played it on the radio once. None of this stuff really took off, but he just kept banging stuff out. The band Quantum Jump did have one unexpected hit that they re-released in 79 before the band would eventually break up in the 80s. So now we're in the 80s. Uh, Hein would release several more solo albums to start off the decade. And then in 85, he would write and produce much of the soundtrack for the movie Better Off Dead. Oh, oh my wow. God. <laughs> so uh, after that, he would release three albums under the name Think Man. He would release 85's The Formula, which featured Stuart Copeland of The Police. In 1998, he would release Life is a Full-Time Occupation, and in 91, he would release Hard Hat Zone. So now we're into the 90s. From the 90s until now, he's been in- involved in several projects, but the big thing out of all of them uh, was he oversaw the direction and contribution to a and contributed to a compilation CD called Songs for Tibet, Art of Peace. The Songs of Tibet compilation in 2008 during the Beijing Olympics was the third most downloaded album on iTunes. So uh, okay. Aside, I mean that's kind of a weird that way of that, that he makes his uh that he uh, makes his money. <laughs> it's the Beijing Olympics. <laughs> yes. That's probably where he's made more money than any of the stuff any of the albums he released before was on was on the uh Beijing Olympics uh songs for Tibet album because of downloads. <laughs> uh, aside from all of that, he actually was a good producer. He actually produced albums for uh Tina Turner, Rush, and The Fix, just the name of a few so now you know who rupert hein is <laughs> i feel like this was one of those music segments all right sit your ass down i'm gonna learn you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i went into this and i've i had heard of the alan parsons project but i knew absolutely nothing about it except that i hoped it featured someone named alan parson <laughs> <laughs> I went into this pretty blind. I learned a ton. It is so weird with both of these guys, just how interconnected they were to some really big name bands and artists. Group in Heinz case, Paul Simon, Jimmy Page, before they were anybody. It's just crazy how when you do when I do the research on this music stuff, just how interconnected it is sometimes. Well, let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode, because I think we're pretty consistent about our love for this episode. But I'm kind of intrigued on where each person is going to go. Let's go give our final thoughts on this one. All right, Melissa, I'm going to pick on you first. I knew this, you were going to go to this me. week. <laughs> What are your final thoughts on this episode? Mm -hmm. Um, I love this episode and I will elaborate on that because what did we watch recently where it was a terrible episode with tubs? (laughs) Uh, There was an island, a woman was shot, and then we just didn't know what happened to her after that. (laughs) The writing for that was terrible. This is great writing for tubs. Finally, tubs gets a good episode where he gets to be the focus and the writing's really good and the plot makes sense except for Luke Diamond Phillips not being in on it. <laughs> um, no, I think it was a great episode and when I watched it for the first time I was surprised by it that how deep that he was in this thing. Like he was undercover undercover. He was undercover. <laughs> like <laughs> and nobody knew it and and I I mean I like everybody in the episode is good. I think 
the bad guy the bad guy mcintyre is a bad guy the worst of the worst he's getting his basically his fellow cops killed and he doesn't care because he wants to make money but i also think it's got to be like a testament to being a cop right because the reasons why he's doing it is because he feels like police department doesn't actually care about the policeman so he has kind of a point like that they just you get killed and you get whatever you just get written off and that's it and we've seen that already they've already lost so many people and they don't ever like larry was an integral part of the team but it's like eh, he never existed all those partners that Crockett lost. <laughs> so maybe he kind of had a point, but of course, obviously going about it the wrong way and greedy. And I do feel kind of sad for his girlfriend because she didn't even want to do it anyway. And I mean, I understand she was doing it and she was going to get money, but now she ain't going to get any money and he's dead. So she's the only one on the hook for it. She's going to have to do time for his things. And he, <laughs> he, he took the coward way out and shot himself. <laughs> but I did want Lou Diamond Phelps to live. I felt like they could have wrote that a little better and they could have let him live and he could and have he could have been in crime story. And yeah. <laughs> or he could have just got exactly. there could have been the realization that Tubbs wasn't crooked and I felt like that was a letdown. But I understand why they did it too because it's like the sucker punch at the end. Tubbs did all this stuff to catch him and he still gets he dies thinking that Tubbs was the bad guy. But Tubbs acting like that was the worst part of him dying. <laughs> I think the worst part you should have said he died, period. Yes, I think getting another cop killed is the worst part of him dying. Exactly. Not that he died not knowing, you know, the truth. John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? So I'm in agreement with you guys. I love this episode. It was fantastic. This is the tub-centric episode that I want. So one, I was convinced that he was undercover from the very beginning. It was only that scene where Crockett's cake partner gets shot with the shotgun or the blanks, uh, where I even at, at any moment kind of questioned whether or not Tubbs was like undercover. But I still love the episode. You know, it took us so many places. I want to know now, what would Tubbs be like as a PI in New York? <laughs> I want to see that show. Someone get this man his money. <laughs> I think that there was there's a few small plot holes here and there through, through it, but all in all, it, it was a really good episode. I still think it was a little bit of a low blow between Tubbs and Zwitek that exchange there. So yeah, I really liked the episode. As far as Tubbs part of the episode, I do feel like someone needs to go into the like writers room and let the guys know, hey, it's okay if we just arrest somebody at the end of the show. <laughs> like they don't have to die, especially with. Multiple suicides happening in front of Crockett, like 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 one is, is a freak accident, two is a weird coincidence, like three is a trend. Like maybe <laughs> they need to open an investigation on that. But all in all, I, I am all thumbs up here for this episode. I'm gonna reiterate a lot of what you guys said. One, I enjoyed this episode. I thought it was really good. And I said at the very beginning, like I was on board. As soon as Tubbs started slapping people around and yelling about its money, I'm like, I'm in. I mean, we need more of this. I want this tubs. I agree, Melissa, that my concern is all with his girlfriend, who, like you're saying, never wanted to be involved with this and was only in it for the money. And now she's arrested and her boyfriend is dead. He committed suicide and she's going to jail. Mm -hmm. So this really backfired on her. Yeah, I mean, you feel bad for her. She actually didn't even get any of the money. <laughs> no, she's not going to get anything. All she did was go on this roller coaster ride, and it was all just for her to go to jail. So I do feel bad for her that she was kind of set up for this, and she even protected him when they came and arrested her, and she wouldn't talk. I'll also say that potholes aside, which is, the big one is, is when did Vice people find out? When didn't they find out? My favorite thing of this episode is Tubbs. And Tubbs, as we have learned, everyone has their role in this show. And Tubbs is consistently the best police officer. Through and through, real police officer, he does the best police work. And you know what else we have learned? Is that Tubbs does the best when he works with so undercover that no one on the vice team except for dad knows what's happening. No backup, on his own, out trying to uncover what's happening in the deepest darkest areas of miami like in the maze where he went in there with no backup and then was held prisoner inside of there when he was inside of the prison and now this episode he is willing to take the chances that no one else on the vice team is willing to do and they trust him castillo especially because he's the one that does consistently the best police work and this is the exact scenario I want to see more of Tubbs. And we have missed that in season three. At the end of season two, 
Tubbs has a really strong role, and he has a lot of these moments. And in Season 3, we have talked a lot about him looking consistently bored in the background. And this was an episode I desperately needed from Tubbs because, again, I really think he is one of the best police officers, and he is at his best when he is taking no nonsense from nobody. And we got it all in this episode, so I loved it. Yeah, The only thing we were missing is an accent. You know, I think <laughs> Angry Tubbs with, with, with like a... Jamaican accent or something <laughs> like that would have been fantastic. <laughs> also, I, I want to say the, the person who I feel the most sorry for, we actually never met. I feel sorry for Camille. Um, <laughs> she never got any. Tubbs left right before. Our, yeah, they, they didn't finish. She, he, Tubbs left in the middle of sex and he just <laughs> never came back. <laughs> True story. Yeah. They never got to the promised yeah, land. Poor Camille was like, still wondering. Like, <laughs> And he took all night to get there and he didn't even finish? God. Yeah. <laughs> what a joke. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love, love, love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com or tweet at us at go with the heat and let us know what your thoughts are on this episode. We are obviously gushing heavily over this. Let us know what you think and let us know what you think about the tubs that we got in this episode. Or about Dominic's beefcake. <laughs> <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> Just saying he's a sexy man. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com or tweet at us at go with the heat. Be sure to check out the website. I just made some tweets to the website, so it should be a little bit easier to get around, a little bit easier to find the feeds. Go check it out, go with the heat.com. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pal. Okay, yep. Let me chew this. <laughs> <laughs> cough drop addiction come to light <laughs> i'll have to answer to you <laughs> you know he just eats cough drops for fun right it's good oh menthol yeah i know i've seen him <laughs> <laughs> he was doing it at your house wasn't See, he? And he gives me crap because i chew on jolly ranchers at least i don't have a cough <laughs> cough, cough drop, drop problem <laughs>